What if the you that you thought was you really wasn't you? What if you had a deeper history buried beneath ages of time waiting to be revealed? Are you ready and are you brave enough to uncover the truth of who you really are? Come with me as we journey to the famed location of King Arthur's Round Table in Carleon Wells and learn a valuable kingdom lesson about what it means to be truly born again and who you really are as a child of God. It's time to get out of the boat and walk upon the waves. Welcome to the journey. Welcome to Kyrleon Wells, a site that's been intimately linked to the legendary King Arthur and his famous Knights of the Round Table for almost 1,000 years. We're deep in the heart of Wales, and the stories of King Arthur flow hard and fast here, intertwined in the forests, the buildings, the waters, and the hills. 800 years ago, this site was a large circular mound with a deep hollow, covered by rolling lush green grass. The 12th century historian Geoffrey Monmouth in his History of the Kings of Britain, believed this site to be where Arthur was named King of Britain, and that this place was believed to be the home of King Arthur's fabled Round Table of Camelot. The idea that Caerleon was the site of King Arthur's Camelot was so widespread that 300 years later an invading French army came to visit the site in order to pay homage to the legendary king. And for 800 years, the Arthurian history of this locale was believed to be absolutely true and there were few doubts about its authenticity. Over the preceding centuries, locals occasionally dug at the site, using the stone found within the mound and buildings within the village. And in 1909, the stone features of the buildings attracted the attention of the Liverpool Committee for Excavation and Research in Wells in the Marches. Finding a number of intriguing discoveries during its first official excavation, the committee enlisted the help of the Daily Mail to raise money for a larger excavation that would encompass not just the circular mound, but the surrounding area. The excavation revealed that Caerleon was actually the remains of a large Roman fortress, and the circular mound was a large amphitheater constructed between 74 and 90 CE, and it hosted animal hunts, gladiator battles, and military parades for the invading Romans. In fact, it's the best preserved example of such an amphitheater in all of Britain. At Caerleon's height of power, the interior wall of the amphitheater was believed to be over four meters tall, and the exterior wall 10 meters high, with the amphitheater's wooden benches providing seating for up to 6,000 spectators, who gathered to watch bloodthirsty displays featuring gladiatorial combat and exotic wild animals. Over 30,000 Roman soldiers lived, breathed, ate, and trained at Caerleon at a time using the fortress as a launching point for Roman invasions throughout South Wales over 2,000 years ago. And while the original fort is believed to have been built after Caesar's first invasion of Britain in 55 BC, within a hundred years the fortress of Caerleon was one of three major such strongholds in Britain. But the Romans weren't the first to establish some kind of kingdom here. The Romans were forced to build fortifications here because of a Celtic people known as the Siliures, who fiercely matched the might of Rome's invasion forces. And 500 years before that, a large hill fort was constructed nearby, which some historians and present-day neo-pagans claim was the stronghold of Belimar, Celtic king of the Druids and early king of Britain. With such a rich legacy that had such a powerful role in the history of not just Britain, but of the Empire of Rome, you'd think that the Latin record of Rome's conquests would have had identified Caerleon long ago and local people would have known what this place was. But you'd be wrong. Hardly any of this site's history was widely known until less than a hundred years ago. This place was so mysterious and otherworldly to the people of the Middle Ages that in the 12th century, the historian Geoffrey Monmouth fancifully attributed the site to the legendary King Arthur, as there was 
nothing else in the region that was quite like it. For almost 1,500 years, the truth of this site was hidden, with false histories and labels attached to it, until that false history became this place's reality. Until a hundred years ago, when those that knew what to look for called out the gold that was waiting underneath and worked to bring it to the surface so its truth could bless the world today. There's a massive kingdom lesson to be found here. There's a you that you think you know, but the truth is, there's a you that was created before time began, the you that you really are. And since you've been born, the world has sought to qualify you, quantify you, categorize you, and define you. You've been given labels, types, and names. Other people, not knowing the real you, have come along and placed their version of you upon you. You've even adopted many of these worldly ideas as your identity, and you've come to accept those identities as who you are. You've created molds and masks around these ideas and adopted yourself to them, taking on the appearance of these identities and accepting them as your own. But see, the real you, you are so much more. You're more than a label or your job or your position. When you allow the world to define you, when you accept those identities as your own and define yourself by them, then you're subject to the whims of the world. You are susceptible to the weight of your false identity. Just like Kyrleon, you are misidentified in your history. Well, it's wrong. And sure, that false history may seem great and may even lean into who you really are a little bit, but at its heart, it's a lie. And when you're defined by the world, well, the world will overwhelm you, outweigh you, and when you don't suit its purposes, will crush you. And when it's done with you, overgrow you. Just like what happened at Kyrleon. But what if? What if the world didn't define you? What if you were actually defined by a higher power? What if there was a father who called you to be more who called you to live your truest identity in whom He created you to be, who created you to be loved by Him and to walk with Him and talk with Him, and who called you to creatively and positively transform this world by demonstrating Him, to define the world with His glory instead of the other way around, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And what if there is a son whose sole purpose when he walked upon this earth was to reveal the love of that father to children who had lost their way and who had let the crushing weight of the world define them and their own view of the father? What if there was a son who revealed a way back to the heart of that loving Father, opening the heavens, rending the veil, revealing to a broken world the truth about a Father's love and devotion. You see, what you think is you is really not. The true you can only be defined by the one who created you, your creator. The true you is loved and cherished no matter what you think you've done or how low you think you've gone. To a loving Father, a son or a daughter is always a son or a daughter, no matter what. The true you is not, could not, be a lowly worm, an unworthy wretch, or any of that other misidentified garbage, because if the worth of something is established by the price that is paid for it, then heaven paid the ultimate price to restore your true identity to you. You were created with purpose, with passion, with love. And while the pain of this world has done all it could to take that away, the Father offers you another way, the way of peace, the way of shalom, the way of acceptance and nurturing and love. But how do you step into that realization? How do you leave behind what the world says is you? How do you dig back through the overgrowth and the false belief and the implied identities that the world has shouldered upon you? Well. In the words of a being more wise than I, you have to be 
born again. You see, this is one of the great mysteries about something we have turned into a catchphrase in the Christian world, the idea of being born again. It's the great mystery behind what Jesus said to Nicodemus. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. John 3, verses 3 to 8. So let's unpack. First, what have we done with what Jesus has said here? Well, as humans doing what humans do, we turned it into a ritual, something we just do. Okay, you say you're a Christian, let's dunk you in water, and after that, you're now part of our tribe, and you're born again. What do I mean by that? All too often, we look at being born again as an add-on, to our old self. And by just reducing it to a baptism ritual, we completely miss out. Yes, there's need for water baptism. After all, one of my most powerful moments with God came after my own baptism. So I personally know how powerful of a moment it is. But the baptism is symbolic of something we miss and ignore, being truly born again. Jesus is saying that we must be born again, born into who God created us to be, stepping into the reality of who we are in His Spirit. We don't base our identity in what the world says about us. Instead, as a child of God, who He created us to be must always come first, and we move from there. And that is anything but an add-on. After truly being born again, you cannot just go back to how you used to be. Let's just take the example of this beautiful archaeological site. Once it was revealed to be an ancient Roman fortress and amphitheater responsible for housing 30,000 Roman troops at a time, could this place realistically be called the site of King Arthur's Round Table? No. Instead, it's known as a place that people once thought as the site of King Arthur's Table. But now the archaeological remnants on site are known by their true identity. Its true worth and glory has now been revealed and can't be covered any longer. The overgrowth has been pulled away. The gold has been identified and revealed. To reveal the kingdom of God, to walk in it, to see it, you must be born again. You have to step into the reality of who God says you are. You have to excavate away the junk that you thought was you and realize who you really are. An empowered son or daughter who's loved and commissioned to reveal his glory to a world that desperately needs it. When you know his spirit, when the real you is revealed, there's something that you know. You are royalty, and royalty has a responsibility to reign righteously, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. That's Micah 6.8. Being born again into the kingdom of God is realizing that He's not an add-on to the old way you did life. He is the source. He is the cornerstone of what you build upon. Being born again into the kingdom of God is knowing that you cannot go back to who you used to be, and why would you want to? It doesn't matter if you live in a caravan trailer down by the river or you live in a penthouse. When you know who you are in Him, you're royalty, and you'll begin to know the kingdom and reveal Him wherever you go. You can't help it. That's what children do. They bear the image of their parents. You do the work of the kingdom because it's who you are. It's not something that you're striving to be. What is born of the flesh is of the world. It's the world that's the add-on, not the other way around. We can only step into who we really are through His Spirit, which is the true source of who you really are. And when that Spirit blows, you might just find yourself like me, 
halfway across the world on a windswept archaeological site, sharing the glory of the Lord. Or you may be in your hometown, radically shifting the atmospheres of your workplace just by being who you truly are, a child of God. God's heart is to reveal your true identity in Christ so you can release His love and to become like Him, moving from glory to glory. He desires to overwhelm your world with the reality of how He sees you and to revolutionize the way you see and even think about yourself and about Him. He's no longer distant or far away. He's right here in you, and you are with Him. You're never alone. You're never in need. You're filled to overflowing, and His grace and mercy radically pursues you all the days of your life, even when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. When you embrace your true identity, you begin to step into the realization of who you are in Christ, and you change the reality of your earthly world. Your God-given nature begins to transform your earthly nature, and you become a light on a hill. And all you have to do is ask, Papa, you're a good, good father. Show me who I really am in your eyes. And don't let go until he shows you. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it'll be given to you. It's the only free gift that's gonna cost you everything, but it's so worth it because you were made for such a time as this. Get ready for the journey because your life will never be the same.